Welcome back. WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and WNST.net in the aftermath of the mess that was Sunday's loss to the Cleveland Browns. Luke Jones, uh, you know, if you were up maybe watching the late game or uh, up in the middle of the night or maybe first thing in the morning, you saw the Mike Garofolo report, and he, of course, was our guest last week here from NFL Network, that there was an altercation after the game. You know, I saw Earl Thomas walking back to his locker. It was the first thing I saw in the locker room, and I tweeted out, because I had been in John Harbaugh's press conference, people had wondered about Earl Thomas pulling up a hamstring because he quit on the long run, and we find out that Earl Thomas was involved in uh, some sort of verbal altercation after the game with Brandon Williams, who's been here forever, who did not play on Sunday, who on Friday kind of shocked the world and got injured. Luke, what do you make of all this mess? This, this, is, this isn't good Monday morning fodder around here when you're going to Pittsburgh, is it? No, it's not. And, and I want to be clear about this. I, it doesn't sound as though it got physical or anything close to that nature, but from what I understand, it was heated. And I think it's, it goes right back to questions that we've asked in the aftermath of a 40-point uh, allowance from the defense on, you know, uh, in, in a game where you had a chance to take control of the division, and instead the Cleveland Browns punch you in the mouth. We talked about leadership. We talked about who on that defensive side of the ball in the meeting rooms, in the locker room, who's that guy that is has the credibility, has the experience to tell everyone else everything's going to be okay, or to provide the proverbial kick in the pants if necessary. And we've talked about Earl Thomas a lot. We, certainly we know his credentials in Seattle and uh, a guy who is certainly at the very least going to be in the strong discussion for Canton, if not a Hall of Fame safety. But he hasn't done those things here. And when you hear about something like this, uh, with a, a player, as you mentioned, someone who's one of the longer-tenured defensive players in that locker room. And look, I mean, Brandon Williams isn't, isn't the, quote, leader of the defense either, but you're talking about... An he's a little bit of a leader of the locker room, though, man. I mean, if you're around there, he's the jolly fellow in the middle. He's the guy that listens to country music and rap music. He's the guy who has the boom box. Uh, I almost refer to him as Radio Raheem, a little uh, Do the Right Thing reference there for you if, you if you're down with that movie and boom boxes. But Brandon Williams is, I would say, the heart and soul of the team, but... He's in the middle there somewhere, you know what I mean? Like, uh, he, he, well, sure, he's more established. And, and, but but uh, my point he's is... He's got more he's friends in the locker room Ed so Reed far than, than Earl Thomas does, I would think, right? Right, well, and that's where you start to wonder. And then you do wonder when something like this plays out. How does Mike Garofolo again, find out about it? That's what I want to know. I mean, for me, does it, do you splinter into groups then where... You know, guys are siding with Brandon Williams. Other guys are siding with Earl Thomas. I mean, basically the genesis of it was that Brandon Williams missed Sunday's game. Uh, John Harbaugh said in the post game that it wasn't an injury per se, that his knee just kind of flared up. Uh, I don't know anything more than that beyond this, uh, as far as the specifics of his knee issue, but I did watch him during the pregame workout about 45 minutes before inactives on Sunday morning, and it was very deliberate. Uh, he did not look explosive. Uh, there was more talking than any doing uh, between him and Joe Cullen, their defensive line coach, Ron Medlin, their athletic trainer, uh, and Wink Martindale was mostly watching from afar. So he certainly didn't look like someone uh, who w was ready to go. But uh, when there's frustration, when you have a, a second-half performance like the Ravens' defense did, and specifically uh, the uh, amount of yardage they gave up on the ground in the second half, then I don't know. I mean, it's human nature to wonder about, hey, is this guy ready to play? Can he play? You know, could he have pushed Well, through? if there would have been a healthier version of him, there were certainly times in the second quarter where I said, you know, I tweeted, if you're wondering whether they're going to miss Brandon Way, you know, we, we've talked about his salary and his value and, you know, what, what could have been done with that money and how many other guys they let leave. He was the guy that stayed, right? And you know, part of that is he didn't play in that period of time during London two years ago when they got ran all over. All of a sudden on Sunday they get run all over, and he's not in there. 
may, you know, maybe he's more valuable than we think if they're going to beef after the game about him not playing, right? Like, it felt like a difference-making decision to me. I think the game might have turned out differently had Brandon Williams been there. Certainly the run uh, game would have turned out a little differently. I don't know about before. that. <laughs> well, okay, a healthy version of Brandon Williams. Not, not well, a, they couldn't stop the run on the outside either. Fair uh, enough. And, and Nestor, they, they didn't stop the run last week either. And Brandon Williams was out there. So, I mean, I hear what you're saying. Don't get me wrong. I think they missed I think them. it was a different kind of attack last week, but, but similar in that you don't want the ball to go over your head, which keeps happening too, right? Right, right. I mean, I, I, this, this isn't a one-player kind of loss. Oh, I, mean, I, is, I agree with right. that. So... And they only gave up. But after the game, if you're looking around the locker room for the guy that didn't play, right, and the guy who was practicing on Wednesday and isn't in there on Sunday, and you're angry, they're all angry after a game. I'm angry. Everybody's angry after a loss, right? Right, right? Who knows what that leads to, but the guy who didn't play didn't pitch in. And if somebody else in the locker room takes umbrage with that and we hear about it, you know, it's not good. It's not good at all. Sure, and that goes back to what I said about leadership and who's telling everyone everything's going to be okay and we're fine and we're going to get this fixed. Uh, I, as I've said, I think they have players who display leader, leadership qualities, but that's not the same thing as being the true leader. I, I think a great example of this is look at someone like Terrell Suggs, who for, for all of his antics and questionable off-field behavior and, and things of that nature over the years, he, he turned in out to be a pretty darn good leader at, by the end of his run with the Ravens. However... He was not a troublemaker on the team. Nobody ever right, had a right. fight with Terrell Suggs. Right. However, in 2004, 2005, 2006, if Ray Lewis and Ed Reed suddenly disappeared, would Terrell Suggs have been the same leader then as he was in 2014? Probably not. I mean, that's something that oh, that's something that happens organically, and we've talked about this. We talked about this post Super Bowl Forty Seven when Ray Lewis and Ed Reed uh, were no longer there. But you still had Terrell Suggs and Haloti Nada, who were uh, you know, Terrell, Suggs was a ten year vet at that point, and Haloti Nada had been in the league six seven years at that point. So you had guys with uh, credentials, longevity and you know, just a track record to command that kind of respect in the locker room. I call it a locker room badge is what I would call it, right? Sure, sure. And uh, now you have some guys with longevity, certainly with a Brandon Williams, uh, a Brandon Carr, Jimmy Smith, but he's not playing right now. Uh, you have a couple guys with Pro Bowl credentials, uh, Earl Thomas, but I go back to... This is his first time here. He did that in Seattle uh, in the same way that probably Eric Weddle was a, a more commanding leader his second and third season with the Ravens, more so than the first, even though he was a leader from the time he walked in the door. Uh, but And you know, Brandon Williams had, was a Pro Bowl alternate last year and ended up playing in the game. But uh, you just don't have a lot of guys that really jump out in that way. So when you have uh, an altercation reported such as this, and let's not be naive. This kind of stuff happens way more than we, as media or fans, know. There's 53 uh, yeah, men in a room. I mean, it, it yeah, really it happens, does. Yeah. And it happens on really good teams, and it, it certainly happens on bad teams. So I want to be clear about that. But when something like this gets out and there's some discussion and there's uh, a player's injury coming into question and the player... Who and we don't even really know what the injury is, right? Like, what's at right, the heart? Right, of it, right. And look, I mean, he didn't tear his ACL. I mean, he was out there working out before the game. Uh, like I said, it was very deliberate and careful. He didn't look particularly good, but it's not as though he couldn't walk. I mean, it's not as though he was on crutches. But it is also interesting, uh, to your point, the guy that supposedly got into this discussion with him is someone who kind of made a business decision on Nick Chubb's 88-yard touchdown run. And look, I don't think for a second, and I, I've rewatched the play probably an additional four or five times, I don't think there's a chance that Earl Thomas is catching Chubb on that play. Uh, in the open field, when he's got a full head of steam, he's, he's not, he's not, able to, he's not going to be able to run down Nick Chubb there. But it's the same kind of thing that we talked about with, you know, it, it's not terribly different from uh, Manny Machado not running out a, a routine ground ball kind of thing. It's like, yeah, he's not going to beat that out, but it's a bad look. And especially in Earl Thomas's case where, 
let's face it, he hasn't exactly made an abundance of plays since the pick uh, of Ryan Fitzpatrick on the first defensive series of the season. It's just not a very good look. It's not good optics. Uh, I don't want to make too much out of that either, but when you do look at this, you know, quote, heated discussion, both sides of it, that's where... Well, when it's those two guys and veteran guys and well-paid guys and, and not bad guys, certainly, one of them played, one of them didn't, one, one of them didn't chase a running back, you know, like, you look at it and say... Well, I wonder how that got started. You know what I mean? Like, um, you know, and I'm not here to write a fake script, but it's, hey, you didn't play, you didn't chase. Who knows, right? And that's easy for us to sit here for the next six days and say, well, why didn't Brandon Williams play? Why was Earl Thomas upset? Why was Brandon Thomas, uh, uh, Brandon Williams upset? And why, why would that happen? And you know that that's. It's now out, right? And, and it's not a couple of special teamers or some malcontents. It's allegedly the heart and soul of the defense. If it's not these two guys who are the heart and soul of the defense, bring Tony Jefferson in. I don't know who it is. Right. I mean, and I, I, there are certainly guys that are, are, have higher creden- you know, greater credentials than other players on this defense. And you know, we can certainly ask about the genesis of it. But uh, my question is much more on the side of how is this received by the rest of the defensive players? Uh, is it a case of a couple guys are heated, it happens, no big deal, or do you start to have fracturing where guys side with Brandon Williams, guys side with Earl Thomas, and, and all of a sudden you just you have a bunch of guys who aren't on the same page. Well, then on top of that, you, you've got a 2-2 two and two team that got their ass kicked by Cleveland and is headed yeah. to Pittsburgh, right? Like yeah. in any season, a 2-2 two and two team that just got its ass kicked at home by Cleveland, just filling in that, right, and heading to Pittsburgh, for a game, we've been doing this 23 years, that's kind of alarming. We got our ass kicked at home by Cleveland, and we're going to Pittsburgh, and we're 2-2. Two and two. And the leagues right, are changing. Right. The, the season's on the brink. No matter what Pittsburgh is or what Cincinnati is, you better start winning some football games. Sure. And, I mean, it sets up fairly well here. And you look at Cleveland's schedule. I mean, I, I, I'm still not worried nearly as much about the standings as just how this football team looks right now on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, Nestor. 25th in total defense, 20th in points per game allowed, 29th in pass D. Their run defense, okay, rushing yards allowed per game, they're 10th. Guess where they are in yards per carry allowed, 26th. This has been a bottom 10 defense through four weeks of the season. and Overseeing two pretty bad teams, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, okay, we can keep talking about Miami. Miami is dreadful. They're, one of, they're probably the worst team of all time in the Super Bowl era. Uh, I mean, that's how bad they are. Look at the other three games. Over 350 yards allowed in the air to Kyler Murray. We know what happened in Kansas City. Again, that game in isolation, fine. But then when you come home and the issues that plagued you in Kansas City follow you to your home stadium uh, against the Cleveland Browns, are you kidding me? I mean, that's, that's so far below the bar, as John Harbaugh would put it, as, as far as what a Ravens defense is supposed to be. So... I think you just look at it, and you know, we can point to Brandon Williams not playing or uh, Earl Thomas pulling up on the long touchdown run or Jimmy Smith not being out there or Marlon Humphrey getting into you know, a, a little you know, scuffle, fight, brawl, whatever you want to call it with Odell Beckham. I mean, you can, you can go down the list of anything you want to point out. It, it, it's basically everything. <laughs> I mean, it, uh, all, of these, all of these variables are hurting them. And, yeah, you can point to no Terrell Suggs, C.J. Mosley, uh, or Eric Weddle. That's been a factor. I mean, uh, all of these things combined have led to what's been a, a lousy defense the last few weeks. And it, it's certainly not trending in the right direction. And to your point, even if you look at Pittsburgh uh, and Cincinnati, and, hey, they entered week four winless, so... You know, you're talking about two teams that would still gladly trade with the Ravens as far as their problems go, but uh, you start having some, some internal issues, and I don't want to make too much out of the Thomas Brandon Williams thing. I'm guessing it probably isn't going to be something that lingers, but uh, they, they, at the very least, it's clear that this defense is not close to being on the same page on the field uh, with blown assignments, I mean, the, that tackling on Sunday was 
as bad as I've seen from a Ravens defense. I mean, that, that was... Well, Rodney Harrison's crushing you on Sunday Night Football about how bad poor. your tackling yeah. is. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the world has noticed how bad this has been. Wink Martindale has noticed how bad this has been. And, you know, there better be some tightening up. It's a 2-2 two and two t- football team that lost this week that's headed to Pittsburgh. Like, that's, that's all you need to know. I mean... It, it, right now, we went from two weeks ago thinking, hey, clear the January uh, you know, calendar to, you know, Tom Brady's coming in the first week in November. We better beware around here. Sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's way more becoming, man, this offense needs to score more points because the defense can't stop anyone uh, of note. So uh, it's definitely concerning. And I, I will say this, in looking at the snap count, rewatching the game, Wink Martindale tried some different things on Sunday. I mean, we, we've talked about it briefly, but Tony Jefferson wore the green dot with the transmitter in his helmet, uh, relaying the defense or, or relaying the calls in the defensive huddle. Uh, it, what, it had been Patrick Owasso, so there was a change there. There were some instances, albeit I didn't see too many, where the Ravens had four safeties on the field. Uh, they, there were a couple plays where they had their two starting safeties and – Deshaun Elliott and Chuck Clark on the field. So, well, Deshaun Elliott did some running, right? For for uh, yeah. Earl Thomas not doing the chase, he did that part. I thought it was Earl Thomas, and I thought Earl Thomas can't run that fast, you know? Right, right. Uh, so, so they tried some different things there. There were a handful of plays where Patrick Owasso was taken off the field, uh, as far as sub packages go, where he had previously been an every snap guy at inside linebacker. I mean, we we keep talking about the secondary, but. I can't stress enough how concerned I am about their play at inside linebacker. Those guys are not getting the job done right now. They just aren't. They're not covering anybody. Uh, they have not played discipline against the run. So, you know, we can talk about Brandon Williams. And, and yes, Nestor, I'll, I'll hear that they missed him. I, I'm not disagreeing with you there. But I just saw a, a lack of discipline as far as gap control. And, I mean, you look at the 88-yard touchdown run. Tyus Bowser doesn't set the edge. A couple guys took some poor angles. And, I mean, it was off to the races. So, but I, I just, I'm really concerned with what I'm seeing from that linebacker group. And I'm really concerned relative to how much they've invested. I don't think they're getting good safety play. And I don't think I'm out of turn, you know, out of turn saying that uh, with Earl Thomas and Tony Jefferson. I mean, I, and I'm not saying putting it, it, it all on them as individuals, but... My goodness, I mean, that's the high, you know, that, that safety tandem is making a ton of money, and where's the playmaking from those guys? I mean, you're seeing teams make plays. All we're seeing stadium. is the chains move and huge pastures in the secondary and literally communication breakdowns, right? Like, right, it, right. these I are mean, communication issues. They're not because they're not good enough. You know, Peanut and Kenny Young may be not good enough in certain ways, but a lot of this is alignment, assignment, and technique and uh, people not knowing their assignment, literally, right? Yeah, but, that, but that's part of being good enough, and that's part of, that, that's <laughs> part of it. I mean, I, Tony Jefferson said it on Sunday, and I, I agree with him, by the way, that he didn't think the communication was as much of a problem this week as it had been the previous two weeks, but he said their, their execution was way worse than it had been the previous two weeks. And look, I mean, trying to decide, okay, 40% against 60%, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not smart enough. I'm but not if a, you're also in the right place, you've got to make the tackle, too. Well, they and have to and do that's my point. Yeah. I mean, they just, there are so many just, I mean, piss poor tackling. It, it was not good. I mean, it, it just was not something indicative of a Ravens defense there. And you know, they tried some different things. They had some different substitutions. You know, we, we saw Anthony Averett for, I think, only 16 snaps. Maurice Kennedy had the interception and, and looked good in the first half. But I saw him cu- miss a, a couple bad tackles uh, in the second half of that. Well, almost game. everybody made a play, in this, right, because the ball was flying around and guys were getting to the second level, right? Everybody made a tackle. Everybody made a play after getting burned two or three times. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, uh, you're not really making a play when you make a tackle 15 yards <laughs> down enough. field. I mean, that's, that's not what you want. So... Uh, it's just, it's not good right now. And uh, there's absolute reason to be concerned. That's not to say that they won't get this thing fixed. There still is talent, at least at certain positions. But you do look at it in, in its totality, and you do look at some of the positions where they're relying on young guys, inside linebacker, 
outside linebacker, and I do question if there's enough talent there for it to be fixed in those areas. I think it can get better, but I'm not seeing evidence that these inside linebackers are picking up the slack for C.J. Mosley uh, in a way that I think the Ravens hoped. And not to say that Patrick Owasso was going to be a Pro Bowl player or, or that Kenny Young was going to be the next Ray Lewis or anything, you know, anything outlandish as far as expectations, but the, the play there has just not been good. Uh, and among the outside linebackers, setting the edge, which was something that I talked about a lot for, for all the talk about Terrell Suggs not being a guy that was going to get you 12 or 13 sacks uh, a season anymore. He was still someone who you could depend on setting the edge uh, on a down, down-to-down basis, and they don't have that. Even their, even their older guys, talking Judon and Pernell McPhee, you know, I've seen those guys have some hiccups setting the edge over the last couple weeks. So if even your veteran guys are letting you down in that regard at least a couple times, then what's that say then about the younger guys who, uh, frankly, Wink Martindale and John Harbaugh haven't shown a lot of faith in, and and frankly, when they've been on the field, they haven't demonstrated uh, any... That they belong on the field. I mean, it's the whole, well, I'll play better if you play me more. Well, play better, and I will play you more. So, you know, it's that whole thing, and John Harbaugh alluded to that last week. So, you know, we saw a little bit more Jalen Ferguson... In fact, he played more than Tyus Bowser and Tim Williams. Tim Williams only played seven defensive snaps on Sunday. But, uh, I mean, they just, they're not getting nearly enough from those guys. And when you see Matt Judon playing 60 snaps and Pernell McPhee, who even, at his, even in his prime was a situational player, he played 47 snaps on Sunday. He's not going to make it to Halloween if they continue to have to play him that many snaps because he's just, we know the history with him. Knee issues, shoulder issues in Chicago. I mean, this is a guy who is playing pretty well, but he's not filling the role right now that they envisioned as far as wanting him to be much more of a situational guy. He's been much more of a, a legitimate starter. Uh, at outside linebacker and sliding inside for those inside uh, pass rush uh, situations. And I just, I'm really concerned about those two positions specifically. And, you know, safety, I'm more disappointed than concerned because, to your point, you do have guys there who've demonstrated you know, that they should be able to play at a higher level than they are right now. So uh, we, we know about corner. I get it. No Tavon Young, Jimmy Smith. I get it. But. You can't brag about how much depth you have in the secondary all off season, and then you lose a couple guys, and and all hell breaks loose. Cleveland was missing three fourths of their starting secondary on Sunday. Now they weren't great. The Ravens moved the ball in them. It's not as though they look like the '85 Bears or any, or the 2000 Ravens, but you didn't see them have the constant breakdowns that the Ravens did Sunday. So, so I don't want to hear about <laughs> one or two injuries in the secondary. That should not cripple your defense. It just that, that, that's, that's a lame excuse. There's plenty of money out on the field, plenty of talent out on the field yeah. that they're expecting a lot from. Luke Jones is here. He is in Owings Mills all week long getting you ready for Pittsburgh. We will be at the Confluence on Sunday for that. All of our WNST coverage brought to you by Full Circle Tire and Auto. Going back to school to work for $39.99. You get a full vehicle inspection, including an oil change of tire rotation. Check them out. Check them out on Facebook. Like them at Full Circle Tire and Auto. Also good to see them at Maritime Magic the other night. Johnny D's, everything's homemade from soups and salads to real turkey. Free catering hall is available at all times. Johnny D, a little bummed the baseball's over because he loves baseball over there, but ready for some football and ready for the Ravens' battles. Proudly serving Parkville since 1954. Find them at johnnydslounge.com. Of course, on Monday night with Nick Boyle at Adams Extreme Motorsports and Adams Jeep up in Aberdeen. You'll hear that in the buyatoyota.com audio vault uh, all week long around here. Don't forget, we were at Roos Chris on Saturday night. I took a spirited group of Super Bowl 35 champions to Roos Chris into the wine room. Same room we were in with Dick Cass a couple weeks ago there. You can plan your private event any event or any time you want, stop by for happy hour. They have incredible happy hour specials at the bar in Pikesville, downtown Annapolis, and specials for meals as well. Roos Chris, if you haven't been in a while, it's as good as it's ever been. Got a mashed potatoes are unbelievable the other night. Had a delicious ribeye. 
And they, they, Jack Del Rio ordered the banana cream pie. That was not a mistake. He was talking all keto and stuff till he ordered that. Then it went all went to hell. Roos Chris, find them at Roos Chris and Serious Steaks. Big thanks to Steve DeCastro as well. All right, uh, Luke, on to, uh, you know, what... What happens here in picking up the pieces? I, John Harbaugh is useless in these post-game press conferences, right? Literally useless, right? So Zrebeck says to him, will there be some changes? And he says, would you like to make some recommendations? I think if I'm Zrebeck in The Athletic this week, I would make some recommendations, wouldn't I? Yeah, and this kind of goes back to what I said a few moments ago, that they did some things differently this week than they did in Kansas City. I mean, so I don't think it's, uh, a sense of complacency. Well, the locker room that. understands it's not getting it done and your job's next, right? Like, literally, there, there are people tapping on shoulders around there looking for gigs, right? Yeah, and, and I, that's where I do wonder, uh, I mean, might we see uh, a, a message sent? Uh, I think back to 2014, uh, that Sunday night game in Pittsburgh where Ben Roethlisberger and company just went nuts against them. Uh, throwing the football, and what happened that, uh, I think it was after the Pittsburgh game, it was definitely that season, they ended up cutting Shockey Brown, and I believe it was Dominique Franks at the time. Now, those two guys weren't, you know, they weren't starting or, or playing 70 snaps a game, but don't don't think for a second that wasn't a message being sent that... Well, that hey, was Harbaugh is- saying this is below the bar, we, we just can't put you on the field anymore. Right, right. So, and look, I don't want to speculate about someone's livelihood here uh, without, you know, knowing for sure, but might you see a couple guys signed off the street and a couple guys sent packing? I mean, that's just, you know, that's just the nature of the beast when you're talking about uncharted territory. I mean, this was the first time the Ravens defense has ever given up 500 yards in back-to-back games. This is just well, this is like a kind of, when they brought in a Sharice Wright, remember when they went to the yeah. street? And, you know, yeah. this feels to be like the, the time where they'll be looking to do, not that, but something like that, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't, especially with the Taro Alaka being placed on IR over the weekend, I wouldn't be shocked whatsoever to see uh, a veteran inside linebacker brought in. Uh, so, I mean, you could certainly see something like that. I wouldn't be shocked to see an edge guy brought in, and I don't know what that means for for some of the incumbents, but uh, it's very clear that there are guys that they're not happy with, and Harbaugh talked about this last week, wanting more from Tyus Bowser and Tim Williams, just as a a couple examples. And you saw Tyus Bowser pick up a sack on the first series of the game Sunday, but he was was one of the individuals that lost the edge on – Nick Chubb's touchdown run, uh, big, you know, 88-yard run. So, Well, these are guys, when you put them out there, 25, 30, 35 plays a game, when we've never seen them, right, other than preseason, we would say, where have these guys gone? Where is Chris Wormley? Where is uh, Tyus Bowser? Where is Tim Williams? Where, you know, where are these names we've heard that Kenny Young was a you know, name we heard for a while here that we haven't seen a whole lot of, we see more of now, and you say, well, why aren't these guys playing? Well, you know, you, you give them snaps and they're out there 20, uh, 20, 30 plays and they either don't make an impact and Chris Wormley batted down a ball at one point, but, but they, you know, they make their presence felt, but then there's 20 plays where somebody ran them over or you don't notice them right. or you, you notice them behind a play or you, you notice them getting pancaked in some cases, right? Sure, sure. And I think what's concerning about this, and I'm going to contradict myself a little bit here, <laughs> is I think there are too many guys like that to just say, well, we're going to make X, Y, and Z roster moves, and we're going to be fine then. I mean, I, I think we always knew that this defense had gotten younger. We knew that in a perfect world the Ravens tried to re-sign C.J. Mosley. We know that they were in the, in the running for a number of edge guys, a number of interior pass rushers from you know, Gerald McCoy on down. So it, it's not as though Eric DaCosta looked at this roster, looked at this defense, and said, we're fine the way it is. I mean, they they very clearly, you know, they tried to bring back Terrell Suggs uh, and tried to uh, get to where, where Arizona was from a money standpoint. But because of what how negotiations had gone to that point in time, Suggs kind of was resigned to the idea of going home for you know the end of his NFL career. So so it's not as though the Ravens just you know, ca- we're, we're cavalier and saying, oh, we'll be fine there. We don't need that guy, or we don't need that guy. We, we've got all the answers internally. They, they clearly demonstrated uh, 
efforts to improve those areas, but they didn't get it done in that way. So now you're kind of left with a bunch of young guys that many of them are playing roles now when they didn't before, or they're playing much larger roles now than they have in the past. And there's two ways of looking at that. Either, A, they can't hack it, and you're just going to have to make the best of it until you can address these things in next year's draft and in free agency next year, and you hope that your offense uh, can play at a, at a, continue to play at a higher level than it did last year, and you hope that your defense can at least clean up some of these things. Or you start to, or you hope that some of these younger guys you, you show some patience with, and that patience is rewarded with better play. I mean, I mean, it's not as though everyone's star players step on the field and they're a star from day one all the time. We've seen so many examples of guys here in Baltimore who were undrafted free agents or late round picks or guys that were expected to be a certain type of player and ended up far exceeding expectations. So it's not as though these young guys can't I ran into better. a bunch of them in the, over the weekend. Will Demps, you know what I mean? The Mike yeah, Flynn, exactly. right? But the, yeah. but, but the problem is there's not that same safety net. I mean, it was really easy for Will Demps to develop. Why? Because he was playing next to Ed Reed, and Ray Lewis was the leader of that defensive huddle. And you, know, you go down the list, I mean, there, there just isn't that same cachet. There isn't that same... Uh, there, there isn't that same lofty standard right there in the huddle uh, as much. And that's not to be disrespectful to their current players uh, and, and current leaders. I, I, I don't want to make it sound like these guys don't know what they're doing, but, but Tony Jefferson's not going to command the same level of uh, respect from a leadership standpoint as Eric Weddle does, quite frankly, or certainly an Ed Reed would. You know, so it, it, that takes time. And... Uh, you know, same thing with Matt Judon compared to Terrell Suggs. I, I, I'm not knocking the, the current guys, but you know, you, you can't you, you can't call an orange an apple if they're not. You know, I mean, that, that's just it, it is what it is. I mean, you're talking about guys that haven't been the Pro Bowls and guys that haven't you know haven't won Super Bowls. In the case of a Terrell Suggs, I mean, that, there's a different level of legitimacy there that that just uh, you can't just force it. it it's got to happen organically. And, and for whatever reason, and I'm not saying that, they're, that, that their problems all stem from lack of leadership. I just think that you know, you're definitely a lot of institutional knowledge left the building uh, in March. And to, to think that you're not going to have hiccups, to think that you're not going to have growing pains uh, in that regard, I, I think uh, was always going to be naive. Now, I didn't think it would be to this extreme uh, degree of struggle and miscommunication and poor play and bad tackling, but here we are. <laughs> and when you're in this position, that's when you do lean on your leaders. And uh, it's easy to talk about replacing leaders in, in spring and when you're practicing in shorts. Yeah, you wait. At midnight, Charles Suggs leaves, and at 2 o'clock the next day, Earl Thomas is here, and you think all is well. And then yeah, eight months yeah. later, you got to play football. Luke, right. I want to take a quick break here, man. We're, we, we're into this. We're into it all <laughs> week long. we got a lot. Of, we're going to be into it. Uh, going. It's Pittsburgh week. What, what more needs sure. to be said? We haven't talked about Brian Billick going into the Ring of Honor. Uh, we haven't talked about the fans. We haven't talked about Lamar. We haven't talked about a lot of things around here. We're going to get to all of that. All of it brought to you by our friends at Curio Wellness in Simone and the Holistic Spa with the top-of-the-line products and experience pros professional v grade vitamins and herbal supplements and of course they are committed to cannabis education and ways to feel better experience the curio way find out more more at curiowellness.com they are in timonium hammer and nails the ultimate man cave nirvana is over in the town center in owings mills manicure pedicure tvs adult beverages hot towel shave relax get your hair done did it's Hammer and Nails. We'll see you out in Owings Mills. Uh, I've been out there a lot lately as well, and you see me wear the shirt around here. Next time you're in Essex, we got a lot of sponsors in Essex. I'm going to hit them all, all right? Start with Pizza John's. I don't have my Pizza John's cup up here because I drank out of it. I took it. I grabbed it from my studio and took it to the game, and uh, it perished at, at the stadium uh, during the game, but it, it was delicious while it lasted. Pizza's still in my refrigerator from the other day. I, I did stop and get my wife a pizza down there. Pizza John's in Essex. Stop by and see them. My wife is craving a cheesesteak, of course, uh, but she always does that on the day they're off. So don't, don't crave cheesesteaks on Mondays at Pizza John's, all right? Uh, also in Essex, Al's Seafood. 
new, expanded. If you saw Robert Irvine come through there, you know my, my son had a cheesesteak there that was phenomenal two weeks ago. Uh, I grabbed some crabs two weeks ago. Al's Seafood in Essex, make sure you stop and see them as well. And of course, Patrick's, my old stomping grounds right on Eastern Avenue. Cold beer, great bands, never a cover. We took Matt Skurr there last year. We'll get back down there soon. Steak dinners on Thursday night, just eleven ninety nine. They have tacos on Monday. Beat the Steelers and eat tacos. Shrimp on Tuesday and wings on Wednesday. It is Pat Ricks in Essex. Reminder, we're at Adam's Jeep on Monday night with Nick Boyle. We're swabbing for the bone marrow registry. We'll be talking about show your soft side a lot uh, and our love of animals. Nick's got a dog. I got a cat. That's the way it works. So Nick Boyle will be joining us. Maybe some of the blue hens will be coming down from Delaware at Adam's Jeep in Aberdeen. You can find all of our work out on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Instagram. We stream live on our Facebook as well as our YouTube WNS-TV channel. And, of course, the buyatoyota.com audio vault is there 24 hours a day to manage all of our good stuff. If you missed some stuff from last week, Ran into Matt Stover on Saturday. He apologized for not coming on last week. That means he'll come on this week. So a lot of Hall of Famers and Ring of Honor guys that, uh, that I saw over the weekend, or uh, Ravens, I call it the Ravens Hall of Fame, Ring of Honor, whatever it is. Purple Jackets, Todd Heap. Saw Ernest Biner over the weekend. Saw McCrary. Hung out with Pete Bowler and his beautiful wife, Kinsey. Talking politics with Pete Bowler. It's a big weekend. Had a lot, a lot of fun. I'm going to recap all that with Luke at some point here this week. We are WNST.net, AM 1570, and WNST, Towson, Baltimore. We never stop talking Baltimore sports.